All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel. Um, very special guest today. I'm actually really excited about this, this particular interview with Steve Green from the United Kingdom. Uh, but I'm actually really excited because Steve has um, a, a, uh, a degree in applied physics and has spent a lot of time in the thermal imaging space, which is super relevant right now. Uh, so first of all, Steve, uh, welcome to the channel. Th thanks for taking some time with us today. Oh, you're welcome, Phil. Good to see you again. Yeah, same here. To it. Uh, so getting back to thermal imaging real quick, because again, it's super relevant now. What uh, what are the most common misconceptions that you're kind of seeing out there? Like I, I've kind of taken the approach of everybody needs to kind of slow down and, and think about deploying mm -hmm. this technology for so-called fever detection. Yeah. What are you seeing out there? Because if there's anybody that's an expert, it is you. Well, that's nice of you to say, but you never forget, you never forget what you were taught when you, when you, when you first worked in that. But I think, as I said earlier, a thermal imaging camera is designed to make, hot objects in its field of view appear much brighter in visual terms than anything else. That's fundamentally what they do, which is why they're really good for perimeter monitoring applications in, in core security, things like that. Um, but I think the danger is that people have, uh, have, have seen this. They've seen the demonstration. It's a very visual demonstration. And there's no doubt that certain camera manufacturers are selling hundreds of thousands of these things. Right. Um, and it would be very easy to take a thermal camera, put it on the front door of your building, your facility, and almost say that everybody who passes through it is too hot, therefore don't let them in through the door. It'd be very easy to do that. But you've got to quantify it. And that's where the calibration of the thing comes in. And with a thermal device, the nearer you are to ambient temperature, the harder it is to be accurate. It's as simple as that. When you measure a piece of steel at 1,000 centigrade, it's easy. The amount of energy that emits is far, far more than what you've got at ambient. So you've got to be able to do that. So the calibration comes into it. And also what you can't really do is point a thermal imager at a group of 50 people coming through a door and pinpoint every single one and analyze every single one individually mm. and pick out the ones that are perceived as having a higher temperature than the others. You know, So you can let a thousand people through a door in a minute. You can't do that. It's just, just not feasible. Yeah. So how important is this thing called a black body radiator black body generator when it when it comes to uh using a thermal imaging camera for the the purposes that the security industry is looking to deploy them for right so it's a, a black body radiator it's a it's a calibrated source of infrared energy which is what the thermal imaging camera detects typically so to get absolute accuracy then you've got to calibrate the device on a fairly regular basis and you can either do that in two ways you can either have a black body reference source within the field of view. So that is a, a nominal temperature of, let's say, 35 centigrade, something like that. So it's the, the, that source should be relatively near to the temperature of the object you're trying to detect, in this case, the human skin. So ideally, that would sit there at 35 centigrade, and that would feed into the imager. So it's calibrating the level at which it works, because you're looking for a really small difference, one degree maybe above the norm, right. normal skin temperature. So you do that. There's other ways of doing it whereby you can also use a thing called a thermistor or a thermocouple um, to measure the ambient temperature of the air within the device or very close to the device. And robotics do it that way for argument's mm. sake. Because okay. Axis and whatever use, you know, black body reference sources. But you've got to use that to optimize and enhance the accuracy that you're going to get. I understand. Now, what about the – how does one grade – how good one of these black body reference devices is. So like if you do a quick Google search online, here's mm. one for a hundred dollars, here's one for five hundred dollars, here's a company selling a full blown mm. uh, suite of products with the camera and the black body and mm. everything for like a thousand dollars or or four thousand dollars. How do how do how does one grade how good one of these reference devices is? Because it seems to me mm. that the system is only going to work as well as the reference device is, right? As as well as it's calibrated. It is. It's, it's correct. And and I think there's no doubt that, um, as with a lot of things, you get what you pay for, effectively. Yep. So when you mentioned, you know, you mentioned $4,000, and I think that's the kind of level that 
um, these cameras are. You know, the ones that we're aware of that we that we know are compliant with Security Center, for instance, um, they're at that kind of level. Sure. Um, because you are looking for small differences, so you've got to get um, a, a thermal black body reference source that's stable, that's reliable, that's accurately calibrated. You know, people are saying you should check the calibration of these things every day, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, every Feed day. the input from that into your camera every 10 minutes and, and check it. You know, that's the kind of thing. So uh, if you're going to use these devices to, to do something as critical as febrile detection, if you want to call it that, um, I think the higher end of the market is the way to go. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, you know, obviously when, when our customers come to us and ask us about mm. this stuff, you know, Mobotics, Axis, FLIR, you know, those are the brands that – that we're thinking of there's a lot of brands that are popping up all over the place and it's like i i can't make a recommendation there because i just don't i don't know enough about the company from Mm -hmm. like a cybersecurity perspective to make a recommendation and i don't know enough about their accuracy claims and you know Mm -hmm. how long they've been in business and what their reputation is and blah 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 but at the same time you know a mobotics camera might cost four thousand dollars five thousand dollars is a significant investment and when you're looking to deploy a lot of those you know that's it adds up really quick you know and that's just the cost of the equipment forget about the cost yeah. of the the labor and the and you know the setup and all that sort of stuff it is and at the end of the day you know we are we're genetech we're a software company that's what we are um we're not experts in in thermal imaging cameras but we we get asked to act as a trusted advisor as we often do you know, which, which is the best access control hardware to use on my access control system? What would you recommend? How would you deploy it? Right. And a thermal camera is no different. And there are guidelines, and that's what we would do. Right. At the end of the day, it's, it's the thermal camera manufacturer's job to sell their thermal camera and prove that it's fit for purpose. And it's our job then in, to utilize the products we've got within the Genetech portfolio, particularly security center and then mission control. Um, to take the alerts, the possible alerts, and and use them and define standard operating procedures to take that event and do something with it. That's right. that's our expertise, and that's what we've been working on the last few weeks. So, uh, and last question on this, and this is kind of a loaded question, to, to sort of uh, take that concept and apply it. So I'm an end user, and I come to Steve mm-hmm. Green, and I say, Steve, what do I do here? What do, what is the recommendation? Like, if I was an end user, how mm-hmm. how would or if you were the end user, how would you be evaluating this technology for use in your own facility? Yeah, so I think there's there's several guidelines, and there's there's a lot of documentation around. You know, IPVM have got things um, on their website, and the manufacturers will help as well um, in using that. So. The general guidelines that I've um, picked up and I've said to people is that you've got to um, to measure this because you're looking for such small differences. You've got to measure people in a controlled environment. So ideally what you do is if people are coming into the entrance to your facility, um, this is a bit like it's like a triage thing. It's a bit like a metal detector at an airport. If somebody passes through a metal detector at an airport and it, and it alerts and goes off, it doesn't mean that they've got a weapon. It means they've got metal. And then it needs further investigation. So you pad them down or test them with a, with a wand, wherever it might be. And a thermal camera is no different. But you've got to control the environment. So you need to measure the people in almost like a, a metal detector kind of area, a, a chamber, which is air conditioned, where there's no drafts, there's no exposure to external heat, there's no windows on there. You paint the facility white so it doesn't reflect too much heat and it doesn't change the uh, the emission onto the human body. You measure at 90 degrees parallel to the to the person. Also, the camera should be within one to one and a half meters of the actual person itself, because the accurate measurement that you should be taking is right in the, the tear duct in the corner of the eye. Ah, OK. Um, and at one to one and a half meters, it's all about pixels on target. And at one to one and a half meters, the, the, the pixel will measure that individual little temperature. If you sit back and measure a 10 meter wide area, the pixels are bigger, and then you average it out. So each pixel generates its own temperature. That's how a thermal camera works. Yeah. So if you're too uh, far away, you'll get an average, and so that little hotspot disappears. Yep. Wow. So it disappears. So you've got to be at those those things, and then if that then generates that one degree increase, which is the kind of figures that have been talked about, you know, normal. Skin temperature can be anywhere between 35.5 and 36.5 centigrade Celsius. 
So typically the alerts have been set at 37.5. Now if the thermal imager generates that alert, we can pull that into security center. What we can then do, utilizing the different parts of the platform and even mission control is to instigate a standard operating procedure, which is then auditable afterwards. Right. So you can then say, we've generated an alert, and then maybe even in that environment through Cipelli or our IP intercom scenario, the thermal imager sends the alert to security center, that sends the alert to the security guards or the whoever it might be, the HR team, that says, oh, there's somebody coming here who we believe might be febrile because they've generated an over temperature alert. You can then get synergies, the access control, to temporarily block access for that person to the building right? and stop them getting in. And then play a message, either visually or verbally, to say, look, can you please go into triage room number one? The person goes into triage room number one, and then a medical professional then goes in that room with a certified medical infrared thermometer and checks the temperature again with their PPE and all this kind of thing. If they still find that they're over temperature, then depending what the end user wants to do, they could send them home or send them to hospital or whatever it might be. But you're documenting all that. And if the person's temperatures then prove that they've then calmed down, they've, they've gone back to normal, you can reinstigate their access control and do this. But you can follow all that through mission control and, and pull all these kind of um, different platforms and technologies together. And then you've got a report. And then we've also got the, um, within Synergis, we've also got our um, new report, the proximity report, You're where right, right. you can then take that data and say, where else has that person been within the building in the last 24 hours and which doors have they been through? And then from the, analyze the database and see which other people may potentially be in contact and then again, get them to be tested. So you're minimizing a potential spread of anything, things like that. Right. I mean, that, that is a super reasonable policy-based approach using mm-hmm. aspects of, right? So we've got a positive read. We send that to mm-hmm. security center. Security center triggers a, an incident emission control. And now we're, we're yeah. stepping through a standard operating procedure. Like this is 100% yeah. policy and procedure based. But in order to, uh, like before you deploy this system, those policies mm-hmm. and procedures need to be thought of in advance. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. This is not something that we're just going to deploy and say, all right, well, let's see what happens. It's like, you, no, 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 you, you need to. You really need to take into account what the policy, what the procedure, what the reporting structure is going to be. Because ultimately, if you're going to tell somebody you can't be here, you're potentially opening yourself up to legal action, uh, you know, or labor disputes yeah. or, or, or any mm-hmm. number of such uh, such things, right? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, some of the thermal cameras work in robotics, for instance. They can play a, a, a visual, um, an audible alert, sorry, and a visual alert. Um, on the camera. So if it detects an over temperature, lights will flash and it'll it'll beep at you. Now, in theory, if you've got other people stood behind in the in the line waiting to come into this cubicle, for instance, do you really want audible and visual alerts going right. off? Did that cause panic? So do it, turn those things off and communicate to the person who's been who's been tested to say, look, stay calm, but please go into this room. Somebody will be with you. It's all about those SOPs, and it, they'll be different for each individual end user and how they do it. We've got the ability to, to program that within mission control. And I like that example, too, because like if you think about something that you said earlier about metal detectors, metal detectors have been around mm. for, for years. We know how they mm. work. So if somebody goes through a metal detector ahead of me and it goes off, I, I the likelihood that that person is carrying a m- metallic weapon is probably mm. pretty small. Uh, yeah. But I, I know what the I know what to look for. Whereas now, the first time I encounter a fever detection system and I see that thing go off, I'm a less educated person on this topic, which is the majority of the population of the planet Earth, mm. might freak out and and say, "Oh my God, I've been exposed to uh, to potentially the coronavirus or the flu or or some other exactly. thing." So it, I, I think that's a really relevant point. Like, don't. Like, if you're going to alert, that almost should be like a silent alert and, you know, pull exactly. that person to the side versus, you know, setting off the, the whole work. So, I, I, Steve, I, I really appreciate, you know, you, you kind of talking us through that because 
I feel like there's so much bad information out there and, and people are rushing to market <laughs> with technologies and with solutions, quote unquote solutions, uh, to solve an issue without really stepping through and thinking about these things. So I, I really appreciate you, you taking some time on, on this one. Now I wanted to